Thank you for joining us and welcome to this month's Star Live session. My name is Julianne from Star Media Group and we're really excited to see everyone here today. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, allow me to share with you what Star Life is all about. As a way of connecting with you, our readers, Star Media Group presents an exciting array of talk sessions covering various topical matters of interest, from guides to leading a healthier lifestyle to meet and greet sessions with personalities. Our guest speakers for today's Star Life session are Dr. Lee and Dr. Noraza. Today, they'll be sharing with us the importance of early detection of glaucoma, a chronic eye disease with progressive damage to the optic nerve, as well as their expert opinions on amblyopia or lazy eye. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A opportunity with our guest speakers. Before we begin with the talk session, just a few housekeeping rules. Please switch your phone to silent mode and please reserve any questions that you might have for the Q&A session after the talk. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Lee to the stage to shed light on the importance of early detection of glaucoma. Let's give her a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very happy to see all of you here. I'm in a Saturday morning, I see very healthy seniors here. You all look very healthy to me, very positive looking. Okay, I'm Dr. Lee. I graduated from uh, University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> okay. And then I had my training. Okay. And I completed my master in uh, University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia, about uh, 2006. And then I, I was working as general ophthalmologist. Then I pursued my subspecialty in glaucoma in 2010, a three years uh, completed program in, uni in the Kementerian Kesehatan. Then I did my fellowship in Moorfield Eye Hospital, London. Um, a little bit of introduction. Uh, glaucoma is a silent thief of sight. Yeah. Uh, usually, patients present very late to us because they have no symptom at all. That's why they, they, they usually come to us in a very advanced stage. Awareness is usually very low among the public. If you ask a crowd of 100 person, only one person know what glaucoma is. So I'm very excited and very keen to give you this talk, to give you a little bit insight of the disease. I make sure uh, you will have a bit more knowledge compared to your friends. I'll share a lot of pictures. Uh, I try to make this uh, lecture as simple as possible. And a lot of story, a lot of pictures, and sit back and relax, OK? Your eyes are the most important sense organ. Everybody got five senses. You can smell, you can hear, you can touch. But your eyes is the most important sense organ. Yeah? The eyes monopolize 65% of the pathway to the brain and 75% of the sensory input to the brain. Your eyes stimulate your brain more than any other sense organ and your eyes allow you to see millions of colors. Your eyes color the effects of all sense organs. For example, if you eat food, it makes it taste better. You want the food to look better, right? With different color. And seeing helps you feel and feel better. If you lost one of your eye, you will lose 25% of your whole person. If you lost both eyes, you will have 85% of the whole person impairment. That is significant. You lost your job. You lost a lot of things. Your patients, a blind patient, usually prone to depression. They lost social contact. They lost everything, and they are very dependent. Among the three major causes of visual loss, 
Glaucoma is the second cause, leading cause of blindness and is irreversible. 80 million patients suffer glaucoma and 11 million have blind from glaucoma. This is the cross section of the eye, a little bit of anatomy. So you can see the front part of the eye is this. Just pointer, please. The front part of the eye is. Sorry, it's not open. Okay. This is the front part of the eye. Yeah, this is a lens. Your cataract is here, and this is the optic nerve. Optic nerves is just like the wire of your television. I always say, imagine your eyes like television. You want a clear lens in front, you want a good wire at the back. So all of us have 1.2 million of optic nerve. Yeah, it serves as a wire. Whatever capture here, focus on the retina, and this wire, this optic nerve, will send the message to your brain to interpret. For example, you look at a, a star, the brain tells you a star. You look at a camera, the brain tells you that is a camera. All right? So this is a cataract. For cataract, vision can be restored by implantations of intraocular lens after the cataract surgery. But for glaucoma, visual loss is irreversible. So for cataract, you just put, take out the cataract and you put the lens here, you can see from blind to see. Glaucoma, how about glaucoma? Glaucoma is a spectrum of disease. Why we call it a spectrum? Because there are many types of glaucoma characterized by optic nerve damage and visual field loss and slowly blindness and so. High intraocular pressure is the most important risk factor. There are two types of water in the eyes. Patient always confused. You see, you, you, you tell patient you've got glaucoma, the pressure is high in your eye, but you, the patient will tell me, but doctor, I have dry eye. But this is different type of water. Okay, look at this diagram. This is your tears. Tears means the lacrimal drug produces tears to uh, lubricate your eye and it flow to the nose. When you cry, the nose run, right? Correct? This is your tears. This is outer circulation. This is the aqueous, means inner circulation. You will never feel the water here. It's called aqueous, yeah? This is the ciliary body produce the aqueous. It contains nutrient, oxygen, to give supply to your whole eye, and the wastewater has to drain out from here. Then we call it anger of the eye. A little bit of lecture. Just remember this one so that you can understand my, my further slide. So at the anger, the close-up view is like that, the flow like that. Yeah? So glaucoma, we, we classify into two types, open anger or closed anger. Simple. I'm not giving you lecture like medical student or, or, or eye doctors. But remember this one, this is the anger, yeah? So that the anger there, the microstructure is called trabecular meshwork. It just work like a meshwork, like a sieve. Many, many layers, 10 layers. So with time, why open anger glaucoma get blocked? Because this sieve cannot work anymore, or clock up. Anger closure glaucoma means this anger very narrow. We'll come to that one by one. So when there is reduced in outflow, what happens is the, the aqueous trap inside the eye and the pressure build up. It press on the optic nerve, causing pressure damage to the optic nerve by mechanically, imagine press very hard on it, the optic nerve will damage, or by depletion of oxygen and nutrient. Who is at risk of developing glaucoma? Of course, high intraocular pressure, Age, different type of glaucoma, uh, come different age. Uh, usually, the majority or most of the cases of glaucoma are primary type, usually occur after 40. The risk increase with age. If you are 40 years old, the incidence is about 2%. If you are 80 years old, the chance is about 10%. Race, certain race prone to different type of glaucoma, like black snake groups, they usually have open angle glaucoma. We Chinese usually have small eye. We are prone to anger closure glaucoma. If your eye is small, the structure all very crowded. You can imagine the anger also narrow. Yeah? 
And uh, family history, for those who have first degree family history who is suffering from glaucoma, they have 10 times risk. High refractive error, very high myopia, or very high hyperopia. Yeah, you, you have risk. And systemic disease, of course, diabetes, hypertension, migraine, all prone to glaucoma. And the, 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 this one, steroid use is very important. In Malaysia, a lot of steroid abuse. They, abuse. they just go to pharmacy, buy Maxon for itchy eye, keep dropping, dropping, then develop glaucoma. Of course, doctors use steroid for other diseases like SLE. There's no choice. You have to use steroid. Those type of patients, they'll refer to us for monitoring of the eyes. Eye injury, shuttlecock injury, or motor vehicle accident, it can, prone, it can lead patients to glaucoma. Okay, first, we talk about this type of glaucoma first because it's the most common type. 70 to 80% uh, have this type of glaucoma. It is called silent teeth of sight because it causes gradual painless loss of vision. It'll, you will lose your visual field first. Our visual fields is about, human's visual fields is about 60 degree here, 70 degree, and 70 degree here, and 110 degree here. If a car comes from here, you can see. So our field is quite big. But for glaucoma, when you start to have uh, optic nerve damage, you have 10%, 20%, 30%. What you suffer is the field loss. It comes very slowly, but the clarity is still there. You can see your wife's face, you can see your children's face very clearly until you lost almost 80-90% of your optic nerve. So you don't realize the sharpness is still there. And the pressure builds up very slowly and patient no symptom at all. Okay, you look at this is the eye of a patient with glaucoma. You see, you look at you with the slit lamp, with the magnifying lens in my room, you can see the eye is normal. The cornea is normal, the lens is normal, you hardly see no cataract. The lens is quite clear, but he's seeing 618. Why? Because the wire at the back has been damaged. So the front part are normal, there are nothing to block the aqueous outflow, and the outflow is like that, open angle. All right? The next slide, when I use the slit lamp to look at, this is a slit lamp, yeah? You look at the eye, this is a normal eye. You see the optic nerve is so nice, like a moon and inside. And uh, our optic nerve is like a donut. Imagine a donut. Huh? Donut is a nerve. Uh, you have fresh around. And the center part, no nerve. Okay? In glaucoma patient, the center part, the hollow, the, the hole has become so big. A loss of all the nerve already. But patients still can see 6, 9. You look at the ABC chart in the eye clinic, patient can still can read until the bottom line. Other features that I can see under my uh, slit lamp, you can see uh, very characteristic features. These are all the glaucometer's uh, cup features. And sometimes they can have optic dead nerve, hemorrhage means bleeding. Okay, for glaucoma patient, when the early part, you see their cup, we call it cup, the whole center is called cup, it's about 0.3. And slowly, when the disease process, uh, progress, then the cup will become bigger and bigger until the end, the blindness come, a uh, patient has hardly any rim of nerve fiber layer there. And what patients experience initially, this is normal eye, can see the whole picture and slowly they can, their, their field becomes smaller and smaller. You notice that the clarity is still there. Yeah? Vision still can be 6-9. When you read ABC chart, you can still read until the bottom. So what type of problem the patient have? They have problems searching for things, reading, recognize face, Walking, they tend to fall at the advanced stage and they cannot drive at the advanced stage. Yeah? Patients have moderate to severe visual loss have problem readings. Especially, they cannot, they cannot read very long and, uh, and uh, in the dim light, they cannot see at all. Okay, when they go to supermarket, they also have problems searching for things. You know so many things in the supermarket? Uh, normal people straight away, I want this, I get it. And uh, the glaucoma patient will take longer time to search. And they have problem recognize faces. They, 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 for example, they, even their good friends on the street, they walk, 
usually their friend will greet them first because they cannot see the face very quickly. You know, our face is very homogeneous. It's brown color. There's no color, one color only. Only protrusion is your nose, uh, your eye, and your mouth. So they have problem recognize face at advanced stage. That is open angle glaucoma. Now we go to second type of angle uh, glaucoma, which is second commonness. It contributes about 20, about 20 to 30 percent of all glaucoma. But this glaucoma is the most fierce type. It accounts for 80 percent of all glaucoma blindness. You take all patients blind from glaucoma, all different different type. 80 percent are from this type. Why? Because it can present suddenly. The pressure can build up very sudden. From normal pressure of 20, it can go up to 50, 70, and patients com come with sudden eye pain, blurring of vision, and very severe headache, and sometimes they have nausea or vomiting. So this type of glaucoma often misdiagnosed as conjunctivitis, red eye not resolved with uh, antibiotic given by GP, or migraine because of severe headache, or even sent to the gastroenterologist thinking they have gastritis. Sometimes it can present as silent. The presentation, 50% of them can present as silent as the other type, open angle glaucoma type. But if you really ask them, what do you have any problem at all? They, then they will say, I have occasionally headache in the afternoon, comes and go, and usually resolve with a, a, a short nap. Yeah? So uh, the pressure can rise up and down, up and down, you know, patient really don't feel it, especially those patients really tahan lasa. We have patients really don't complain one, you know, they can tolerate. And, and this one, they behave like open angle glaucoma. When you look at the eye under the slit lamp, you can see the angle is very narrow. There's a, hardly any space between the cornea and the angle, and you do gonioscopy, one type of diagnostic test, you see the angle is really, really shallow. And when they come with an attack, their eye is really red, and the cornea is hazy because the pressure is too high. Yeah? And you see the angle, there's hardly, hardly any angle. There's no distance between the cornea and the iris. These are the two commonest causes of glaucoma. Uh, in the following slide, I will show you many other types of glaucoma. All right? All pictures, sit back and relax. This is one type of glaucoma called pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma. In the patient's eye, they have this dandruff material. Look like dandruff, it blocks the drainage site, so the pressure builds up. Normally, this type of glaucoma, they are asymptomatic as well. The pressure builds up slowly. And this is another pigment dispersion. I just operated a Swedish man with pigment dispersion glaucoma in her is 40, also asymptomatic, but slowly the pressure rise slowly. And this type of glaucoma is this is a, this type of glaucoma is due to severe inflammation. For example, patients have ankylosing spondylitis, one type of joint disease, yeah, with severe inflammations or they have an anterior uveitis. Any inflammation in the eye can cause secondary glaucoma. That means the pressure can build up. Huh? The pressure build up and damage the optic nerve, then they are called glaucoma. Okay. This is a very common in Malaysia, badminton. Shuttercock injury, hit by the ball and the eye bleed inside the eye, and this blood clot will block the drainage side of the eye, and the pressure can go very, very high. This is another common scenario in Malaysia, uncontrolled diabetic. If you have diabetic not controlled, you will soon develop diabetic retinopathy. That means uh, bleeding in the, at the back of your eye. Sometimes the new vessels can form at the front of the eye and cause bleeding here. And the blood clot block the aqueous outflow. This is another case. This is a case of retinal vein occlusion. You have uncontrolled hypertension. Suddenly, the vessel block in the eye, and the new vessel form, and it bleed, and it cause secondary glaucoma. This a patient came to me last week. It got hypermature cataract. If your cataract is too mature, you don't do anything. The pressure also can build up. The last type of glaucoma is childhood glaucoma. Children also can have glaucoma. Primary glaucoma, that means they are born with it. You look at the angle, it's normal, but the pressure builds up. That's normal and in the drainage side. 
The secondary, that means they have some syndrome. Yeah, some syndrome, some illness which is associated with glaucoma. Patient present with a very big eye, bull eye. Huh? We call bull eye and uh, they have tearing, they shun from light. You look at the cornea, it's very hazy. This is one of my patients, you see, he presented to us already blind. She got Stuchweber syndrome, this is syndrome. If you see any patient with pot wine stain, ask them to go and screen for glaucoma. Presented to us at six years old, this eye already blind. You can see the eye is bigger than this. Because the children's eye is still elastic. You got pressure built up in the eye, the eyeball can expand, but not in adult. Yeah? So diagnosis of glaucoma, how do I approach? When the patient comes to see me, I, of course I ask a lot of history, I assess what are the risks they have, I examine their visual acuity. Don't take visual acuity as a yardstick because a patient can still see here 6 9 but it doesn't <coughs> exclude glaucoma, good visual acuity. We check the pressure, we assess the angle, we use the slit lamp to check the back and the front and we do visual field. Visual field is to see how bad the, the glaucoma is, not, not help, uh, and uh, we do some diagnostic stand, optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer imaging. Sometimes we need to do a CT scan of the brain because some brain tumor can present with visual field defect. This is an example of patients. Uh, he is a Caucasian. He come to my clinic say, doctor, I can't get a pair of good, good glasses. Keep blaming the optometrist, not good, the glasses not good, but when you do a visual field, you see this one. But his vision is 6 9, no more tension glaucoma. So intraocular pressure is very important in the diagnosis and management. The only one thing doctor can do is to lower your eye pressure. We can't change your age, we can't change your genetic predisposition. We know that lower your intraocular pressure can reduce or can slow down the disease process or can halt the disease process. How do I manage? Normally, first line of treatment is medical. We give eye drops. Yeah? We have different types of eye drops. Laser treatment is for selective certain types of glaucoma, usually open angle glaucoma. Uh, and angle closure glaucoma, we do laser PI later, I'll show you. And those uh, with very uh, fast disease, you know, very fierce disease, pressure cannot control, we have to do glaucoma surgery. Sometimes when you see patients with already blind eye, painless blind eye, although the pressure is 40, we say just leave it. You, you, you can choose not to do anything. We cannot do anything anyway. Okay, for a patient come with an acute angle closure attack, the pressure is so high, you have to lower the pressure immediately because the patient can go blind within two, three hours. Yeah? So we'll give the, all the medicine we have in our hand to lower the pressure immediately with the eye drop. We give oral medication. We also set the IV line, admit the patient. And the emergency thing is we have to do a laser peripheral iridotomy. Later I show you what is it. Sometimes we have to do emergency cataract surgery. You can see how fierce is it. Patient with acute angle closure glaucoma is very dramatic presentation. What happened in their eye is the angle already narrow and the water trap here. Sorry. And the water and the water trap here. So you can make the, the angle is totally blocked. That's why the pressure suddenly rise. Yeah. What we do is we do a, a laser here, create a shunt for the aqueous to flow to bring down the uh, pressure immediately. Sometimes emergency cataract have to be done because after taking out the cataract, uh, the cataract is at the back here, you do the cataract surgery, then the angle will open up because the cataract is about four to five millimeter thick. If you take out the cataract and you put an artificial lens here, uh, then you open up a lot of space for the aqueous to flow. Let's talk a bit about glaucoma surgery. This our I was trained in Moorfield Eye Hospital. This was our operation theaters. This is one type of surgery called trabeclectomy. What we do if in patient page pressure cannot control, we need to lower the pressure a lot. We we, we do we uh, basically create a hole here, yeah, for the water from the eye to shunt to the back. This is procedure is called trabeclectomy. 
Another type of surgery is we put an artificial drainage device inside. Uh, we have different type of device. This is Ahmad valve, this valve we put here, and the tube here to shun, to low, shun the aqueous away to lower the pressure. So who needs glaucoma surgery? Those with uncontrolled eye pressure, allergy to glaucoma eye drop or non-compliance to eye drop. And uh, the, these are the indications for the tube uh, shunt surgery. Here, the following few slides, I'd like to share with you a few, few real case scenarios, yeah, real patient. This patient of mine since the 2011, present to us with cut this ratio of 0.9 both eye. This is the visual view. You see this is 24 degree only. This one, the black area is threatening the cross already. This is the center part of your vision. So it's threatening. So I advised him for trabeclectomy. He was already on two medications or three medications. So this is the uh, one week after the surgery and at, uh, at that three months, the shunt has worked very well. I've seen him last month and both eyes have got pressure of uh, 10 millimeter mercury, 6-9 vision without using any medications. So who say glaucoma cannot be cured? I cannot bring back your optic nerve, but it can stop there, all right? So primary open angle glaucoma, early detection is better, early treatment can prevent blindness. How about this case? This is an angle closure glaucoma presented to our emergency room with severe painful red eye. Pressure was 53. You see, look at the eye. Pupil already dilated. When your pressure is too high, your pupil cannot constrict dilate normally. The mechanism is just stopped there. Uh, jam already, people say. Yeah? So immediately, I do what I, I need to do. I do a laser PI here, laser, open a small hole and the, the attack was aborted, pressure was brought down to normal, but you see the, visual, the pupil is still dilated. If you have a pupil cannot constrict, you cannot have 6-9 vision, you probably have 6-12, 20-30% of impairment. So you can't get good result if you come in an emergency. Surprisingly, these are the eye got attacked. Yeah? The optic nerve is better than the other eye. You, the other eye, no symptom at all, no pain but it present like open anger. So anger closure glaucoma can present suddenly or they can present very gradual, slowly like open anger glaucoma. This is another patient. This uncle come to emergency department, tell the ER doctor, I have stomach, I want to vomit. So they sent to, <laughs> I feel like vomiting, they sent to the gastroenterologist. Was delayed, he was kept in my hospital and referred to me one day later. That's why I say this type of glaucoma can mimic as gastro problem, yeah, because uh, sometimes they can end up seeing neurologists do CT scan, after that only send to eye. There's a delay there. So primary angle closure glaucoma, early detection is better than later, early treatment is better, of, and of course prevention is so much better if you can catch it earlier. This is the last case, 20-year-old Indian medical student with shuttercock injury. He was admitted in one of the private hospital for four days with uncontrolled pressure. Came to me, I put a shunt in. Until today, the visual acuity is 6.6 and uh, cup this ratio is 0.3. This is very, very inter early intervention. We don't want any damage to happen. We know that with pressure of 40, 50, eventually the optic nerve can, can, can go totally. But we know that then we have to do it fast and do it quickly and you get very good result. These are the patients uh, uh, referred to me, uh, worsening visual field, uh, I put a shunt in. And this one also, this is a very young patient, 47 year old, high myopia, I also put a shunt in. You can see that the visual field got better after you put in the shunt and he's no more medication. I think, I cannot say that the nerve has uh, been revived or to go back the new nerve, but what, what we can explain here is because here, he used a lot of medication as well, all the side effects of the medication can uh, slightly jeopardize the visual field a bit. So you can see the result is very good. This one is uh, uh, referred to me for complicated cataract surgery. If you do cataract surgery, end up with complication, pressure will go up. And this type of uh, glaucoma, secondary glaucoma, you need a tube inside. This another one with tube inside. 
So this is the final sign. Uh, in conclusion, glaucoma is a preventable disease. Early eye screening is important. Early detection and early treatment give you better outcome. Preventive measure for angle closure glaucoma, you can do a laser and timely cataract surgery. It means you're, when you have cataract, you have to do it, you have to do it, don't wait. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. For our next session, join me in welcoming Dr. Noor Azhar up on stage to share with us more on em amblyopia. All right. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm Dr. Noraza Abdurrahman. Um, okay, my next topic will be on children. Okay, it could be for your children, for your grandchildren. Okay, and uh, please stay awake and um, you can sleep after my talk. All right. All right so, what is lazy eye? So some people told me, oh, what is lazy eye? Lazy eye is when the eye is lazy, meaning what? They don't move like the normal eye. So maybe one of you can see this uh, photo of a child where the eye is actually, where is the pointer? Okay. The, the, the eye is squinting inwards, and when you try to move, it doesn't move. But how about this photo? This is a, essentially a normal, cute little boy. So how many of you think that this is a lazy eye? Can we? Show off your hand. Okay, nobody want to. <laughs> okay, don't worry. There's no wrong and right here. Uh, some people say no. This boy don't have lazy eye. This look normal, right? But I would say yes. This could be a lazy eye. Or they cannot. This the, this child might have normal eye, and this normal looking child can have lazy eye. So we don't know. So that's the thing that we need, I want to emphasize today. Okay. So basically, what is lazy eye? Is a disorder of a visual system okay, caused by disturbance of vision during a critical or sensitive period of development. So the word here is critical. What is the critical period? All right, so basically, amblyopia affects about 3 to 5% uh, of the worldwide populations, but it can be affecting both eye or one eye. In Malaysia, we have a figure done in the Sigamat Pediatrics uh, Eye Studies in 2016, and we have a figure of 7% of the child preschooler has lazy eye. So what is critical period? Critical period is a period uh, where the eyes, the brain is very sensitive to an abnormal input. Now, if you see here, is this is where the eyes see, right? And the image will be transferred here to the nerve, and go all the way back here to the visual cortex to get analyzed. So in the child, when they were in the womb, it stays in the dark. And when they were born in this world, how does the brain learn how to see? This is what we call a critical period. Okay? And it, the first crucial is at the first two years of life. And it develops up to eight years of life. After that, the brain will just accept whatever that it has learned. So if anything happened during this critical period, it, it is, will affect the visual development. And if you manage to overcome the troubles during the period, it responds so well to treatment. All right now, let's see. This is how the lazy eye works, okay? So it's essentially of the, uh, what do you call it? It's essentially a problem of the brain rather than the eye itself. So I always mention to my patient, eye is like a hardware. Your brain is the software. So what happens if you have one clear image here and one blur image here? Now, children's brain, they are very smart. They don't go into details and learn and analyze. No, they just wanted to play. So what they do, okay, forget about this. Let's go and think about this. So they dominate this. So one eye becomes a dominant eye. And this image from this eye will be suppressed. Now, what cause amblyopia? Some say it could be squint eye or strabismus, or it can be normal eyes. I mentioned earlier, right? 
So the number one cause of um, MBLIPI in Malaysia is basically high eye power or refractive errors. Or they are different between the powers in between the two eyes. Okay, so let's see. So what do I mean by refractive errors? It's very simple. Now refractive errors, we have short-sightedness, long-sightedness, and astigmatism. So normal vision, you should be able to see near quite clear, distance also quite clear. In the short-sightedness, we can see near clear, but distance is very bad. This is mostly uh, many of the Asian uh, kids have. Okay, but uh, will they all have amblyopia? No, only who have very high amblyopia, a figure of more than 800 diopter will have uh, both eye, lazy eye. And how about uh, hypermetropia or long sightedness? This is a condition where you can see distance clear, but near very blur. Okay, so based on uh, a figure given by the American Academy of Optometrists, a figure more of than plus 500 diopters will lead to both eye lazy eye. How about astigmatism? Now, many of us do not know what is astigmatism. Now, astigmatism happens when, you remember Dr. Lee shows you a photo of the cornea that is very curved. So one meridian has one curvature, and one curvature will carry one power. And the meridian of the 90 degree to it also have another curvature, right? And it, if the curve is the same, so the light the point of light will be pointed to a same uh, point in the retina. So the vision will be blur. But what if the curvature is different meridian? Like imagine you're talking about football and a rugby ball. So one meridian will focus in front, one meridian will focus at the back. So essentially, your vision will become blur for distance and near. Okay. So how about different refractive power between both eye or an isometropia? You see one eye receive clear vision, and why receive uh, blur vision. So the different power of, sorry, the different power of the minus three between both eye already have risk of lazy eye. Or even plus one. Imagine one eye is plus 2.5 and one eye is plus 3.5. It's already a risk of amblyopia of the one with higher power. Or the different in estimatism of plus or more than minus 1.5, all right? So essentially, one eye, the one with the poor vision had uh, risk of lazy eye. Okay. The other cause is basically strabismus or squint. Okay. So some people say, oh, my grandchildren have squint. Do you think they have lazy eyes? Well, depends. I would say that only the one if affecting only one eye and it's constant all the time, meaning it's not alternating. Some children, they have squint, but sometimes you can see the right eye, Another moment, you see it happening in the left eye. So those are good. If you have only one eye all the time, you have a risk of lazy eye. Now, screen happens when you see at distance and near, or it goes inward rather than outward. And you see the screen in early onset, meaning during, during infanthood or any, uh, any during early childhood. Okay? All right. The other cause of lazy eye So what happened when you have squint? Okay. So you see over here that one eye is focused in, in the object. And the screen eye will focus actually in the same object, but the image will be uh, pointed at a different part of the eyes, and the brain will see it as double visioned, correct? Double vision. So you see something like this. And it's very confusing for the brain to analyze it. What is this? So what happened is that So instead of this, the brain will suppress the image coming from that eye. So you only see as one. All right. Now, another form of lazy eye is form deprivation. Form deprivation means that your eye can't see the object. It can be due to cataract. As Dr. Lee mentioned earlier, cataract is reversible. Cataract is basically opacity of the lens here. And some people say, they ask me, you know, old people, old patients oh, have cataract, but children can have cataract. I would say yes. Children sometimes they're born with some metabolism or they are syndromic. They do have cataract early. You know, some even born with cataract. So when they have cataract here, it it deters the image from being focused to the retina, and your brain does not receive any input at all. Oh, they have 
droopy eyelids, right? Now, many of us have kids with droopy eyelids like this. So how do we know whether this is an emergency or not? It's very simple. You can shine a torch and you can see the light reflects. You see, this baby had a right reflect exactly on the cornea. And you can see it. But at this side here, you don't actually see the right reflex on the cornea. Meaning that, that droopy lid is covering the visual like this. Then this is an emergency condition that the eye need to be corrected early. If it is, if you can see something like this, but the child adapt by looking up like that is okay. Then we can buy time. Meaning that the screen can be repaired a bit later. All right. Sorry, the, the droopy lids can be repaired a bit later. The next thing is cornea opacity or any hemorrhage in the eyes that can give rise, which can be removed with surgical mint. Now, how do we treat lazy eye? Simple glasses, all right? And then corrections if they have any squint. Penalizing therapy. I'll explain to you what is this therapy all about, or visual therapy. Now, number one, you have to know what is the visual acuity. How does the child see? And you have to know what's the eye power. Does the eye power give rise to lazy eye? So we do. We do them. Um, we check refractions. Now, corrections of uh, refractive errors in children less than seven years old, they need to go to a center because children's eye, they are very powerful. They can focus very strong. They can change the eye power within the eye because there are strong intraocular muscles. So mainly if you go and bring the kids to a, any optometric shop, they say, no, we don't do children because they need to put some special eye drops in the eye to paralyze the inner eye muscles. Then only we know what is the true eye power. All right. Then we give them glasses. All right. So glasses can be given at any age. If you see a baby, we can use this jelly-like frame. They can throw it, it never break. All right? And they even have a, a stopper in the ears or a, a string to basically fit in their eyes. Okay. Now, many of my patients say, Doctor, so pity, so small, already three years old, have to wear glasses. Now, then I tell them, you know, you don't pity your child, you have to pity the brain. The brain needs to receive a good image. Because why? This is a critical period. Remember I mentioned about critical period? That's the time you need to teach the brain to see good image. Because if you can only introduce glasses when they are eight or nine years old, that will be too late already. All right. The trend now is basically give them good glasses so that the brain receives good each mate, so that the brain develops very well, and they can go for LASIK or any refractive uh, procedures when they're 18 or 19, when they, they reach their age where their visual their refractive errors is actually stable. Okay, so um, what if they have squint? It's the same. We realign the eye, so the eye is straight. So the image we falls into the correct point in the eye, then they will see single image rather than double. So you see this baby who had a congenital squint, and the eye is inwards, all right? And when the eye is fixed like that, the child has difficulty in looking the other directions. I will show you how this child actually focusing, right? So when we talk about screen surgery, most of my patients will ask me, Doctor, how do you do screen surgery in my child? Do you going to take the whole eyeball out, adjust it, and put it back inside the socket? Well, I, I, I must tell you, please uh, don't Google or don't ask your friend about screen surgery. You, you must ask to the right a proper, res uh, trustable resource. Whereas basically there is no um, technology that allow you to take the one eyeball out and do the surgery and then put it back, okay? So what we do is basically, we, we adjust the muscles that hold the eyes, okay? The muscle is located outside the eyeball. So when I explain to my patient, I tell them, it's like this. When you send your car to uh, the repair workshop, we don't touch the engine, we only adjust the tire and then they understand. For example, this case, this is just day one after surgery. They're worried about the scar, they're going to be have like sutures everywhere, blood everywhere. No, I said, no it's just going to be some redness here, and that's it. All right? Now, now look at how this child uh, trying to focus. You see, this child had a very, uh, what you call, tight eye, you see? So what happened when the child has what we call cross fixation, when, when she tried to look this direction, she will look, they op use the opposite eye to look here and use this eye to look at another directions. So when we had the surgery done and see how the child move, 
when the object is being or the toys is being moved away. So the eye can move all the way out without having any difficulty or tightness. All right. And this one is about one month after surgery. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, we have inward screen and we have outward screen. Now look at this child. Now the eye is moving here and this eye is moving this direction. This is what we call an exotropia. In this condition, initially it usually started intermittent, meaning occasionally you see one eye moving and it comes again and the other eye move. But after a long run, it becomes constant. When it becomes constant, we don't like it because what happens is that when the eye moves, the image will become double, right? But the brain suppresses that, that eye. So she only use one eye to see. So when this eye move out, this become double, and the brain will suppress this eye to see. What they have, we have alternate suppression. The brain keep on suppressing, off, 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 off. Soon it will develop in blind people if you don't correct it. So when um, he came to me, it's already constant, but we managed to do the surgery and the eye is quite straight now. Now to maintain the... Um, uh, the eye to remain straight, we must give them a good vision by correction of any underlying refractive error. So the eye, both eye can focus well, that they can see well. All right now, penalizing the good eye. So how do we make a lazy person move? Do you already lazy, you know? We have to force them to work, correct? By not doing anything, let them do all the job, right? Let them do all the work. It's very simple. If you see this, this is a normal eye, all right? So this is a good eye that, that is doing all the work for the brain. And this is the lazy eye. The image is blur, it's not focusing well, and then, so what happens is the brain ignores input from the weak eye. So what we do is we penalize the image here by patching. There are other means of penalizing. One of it is patch. We, we, we block this eye from working and force the brain to work hand in hand with this eye. So what we do is basically patches. Now we apply patches, all right, for a child. And this is a gold standard because you see it covers the whole eye. So they cannot peep, all right? If they don't like patches, maybe they hate things on their face. What they do, if they need glasses, we put these sliding occluders on the glasses, okay? So we alternate patch, which one is weak, so we patch the eye. But um, this is very tricky because all the time you have to monitor the child. Sometimes they like to peep, you know, they open up, they see, and that's not counted. All right. Next is uh, the problem with patching. Now, because patching, they have to wear it every day. And depends on the time. It can be two hours, it can be six hours a day. Some develop allergy towards the patches here. This is the adhesive patches. And uh, some of it easy to move. And uh, some parents, they will ask me, how many times should I wear this doctor? How long can it last? Because they want to gmat, you see. So they say, what I do is that um, I, I apply it, and tomorrow I keep and I apply again. So tomorrow, the next day and all that, the adhesive is not working anymore. So it tends to drop and the tends to peep through the normal. So it is not working well. All right. Another thing is compliant. Okay. Whether the child likes to do patching or not. Most of the time, using the good eye. So now you cover the good eye, you're forcing the child to use the, the blurred eye to see, the lazy eye to see. They don't like it because they don't get, new, they don't get clear image. So they get upset. They become grumpy and then become grumpy, they go to sleep. So number one, I will explain my patient. Number one, you have to motivate the parents. Sorry. You have to really motivate the parents first, and then the child. Most of my patients, what they do, they apply the patches, and the parents go and do their hosting, and the child stay and watch TV, and then sometimes they went to sleep. So sleeping time is not counted as patching time. Okay? So what we do, we, we give them uh, a duration of patches. If the lazy eye is very mild, it's about two hours a day is enough. It's very severe, you must get six hours a day. Then you can see the result. Okay? Most of the time, when my patients come to me, I give them a chart. So I tell these kids, okay, this is your homework. Your next visit, you must bring this back to me. I want to see. It's, it's, it's actually basically an a, a, a image when they, do, do, they document their patching time. If they manage to get one hour a day, they color one object, something like that. And during follow-up, they never bring anything back. 
if they are smart enough to remember, they bring the, the same old uh, patching chart again with nothing on it. So that means that this, these patients, they are not motivated to work. You, know? you really have to motivate them again and again and again and, and to get a good result. Now, so remember the earlier photo I showed about child smiling with patches on. Those are all, uh, I would say, industrial gimmicks. This is the real things, you know. So it's very stressful for the child. They don't like patching, and it's stressful for the parents as well. And the other thing, if you have to ask a bigger child to wear patches, they're being laughed at school. They're being labeled as pirates, and so on. So another alternative of patching is atropine eye drop. So atropine eye drop is basically an eye drop to put in the good eye to blur. What atropine does is it dilates the pupil, and the image will become blur. So indirectly forcing the lazy eye to work, okay? But atropine only works in very mild and blyopic because if it works, um, if the, um, the lazy eye is bad, the vision is very, very bad, if you do it on the normal eye, it blurs a little bit, this still be a good eye. So it doesn't work that way. Now, so atropine is a, uh, is a drop that dilate and cause loss of accommodation. And one drop, the effect will last about um, uh, two weeks, okay? But they have side effects. For example, flushing, uh, they have, can have dry mouth, uh, tachy tachycardia is uh, awareness of your heartbeat and goes fast. They can have hyperactivity, sometimes they can have fits. Now, um, some school going, they hate patches. So this is the thing, um, because they're being laughed at. Okay, so the other options that you can give them is asking them to try and use what we call liquid crystal goggles. And I have it with me, the liquid crystal goggles. Okay, it's actually a goggles where it will clear, and then when the patches, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, it can be programmed where which part, let's say we choose one part of the eye, become just become darkened for 30 seconds for every minute. Okay, so. If you need to wear your patches for two hours, you have to wear your goggles. Double the patching time is about four hours. So it looks cool. The child can go out and play in the, in the park with this look. And it, it also have one uh, additional frame when you can correct a refractive error while wearing these patches. So if you look at this photo here, this is basically where the child is seeing. And then without noticing, every 30 seconds in the minute, it will darken and automatically it will lighten again. These are the amazing things that I managed to get uh, for you if you want to see later. Um, but this is very, very costly. It costs about 400 USD, about 2,000 Malaysian Ringgit. Okay? So you want to spend that much of money, no, not knowing whether uh, the outcome is good or not. So people, most of them, they revert back to patches. Now, so there is another therapy called dichoptic therapy where it has uh, using these goggles, one eye will see red and one eye will see blue. And there are games online that you can download in your iPad or phone to basically allow the child to play. And the advantage of this therapy is that we are using two eyes rather than one eye. So it does not disrupt your binocular visions. And also, people are now going into um, uh, games and a lot of other Tetris games and all that. Um, another thing is where, you know, this works where the weak eye is given um, a feel of higher contrast. Um, all right, so. And at the end, when they use both eye, they don't see the difference. Okay, so for example, this photo: the left eye is seeing this, the left eye is seeing this. But what happened if you have one dominant eye? That's the only thing that you see. Depends on your dominant eye, the left or the right. You only see one. But if your brain can able to fuse, you will see both at the same time. So this is what we want to basically train the brain and train the eye to work together to overcome lazy eyes. Now, some companies overseas has developing a VR a games to basically, uh, what do you call that, stimulate the child to do patches. Now, we are moving our normal patches. Hopefully, in future, we have this available in our country. Now, in summary, lazy eye is a loss 
uh, sorry, vision loss is preventable or reversible if you can detect it early. Lazy eye should be identified at young age. And um, younger age, if you treat early, the prognosis is good. Now, screening for lazy eye can be easily performed with vision screening program. Now, um, many, many years ago, children is, children, school children were screened at about seven years old when they go to primary school. But nowadays, the government has implemented a new program where the uh, private and the government optometrists will go and visit the um, kindergarten and they will stage um, and, and do some visual screening among these preschoolers and hoping that those who have problems, they can detect it early and they can refer to the the doctors or for corrections of vision, all right? So as mentioned earlier, so um, you, you have a better outcome when the child is young, all right? Okay. Um, the current, uh, what do you call that, um, uh, practice now is to, to detect the lazy eye at the age of four to five years rather than seven years is how being done in the previous age. Now, many of my patients ask me, doctor, how do you check your baby's eye, you know, when they are baby, when they are young? When they are four or five, they can verbally say, you can test whether they can read signboard, whether they can see things and all that. So I told them this, basically, it's very simple. You can use things at home, for example, this Mentos, m and &M, mini m and um, This is, you know, what is this? This is what we call 100,000. It's basically the little, little sweet thing that you apply on the cupcake. All right, and also it come in various sizes and color. So, so just look at this video where I test this healthy boy. Uh, what you need to do is you test both eye, and you have to test each eye. Now, notice that the grandfather is trying to cover one eye, and the child disliked it. But after some time, she liked to understand. Now, we can what you do, you can try a different different sizes and see whether he can do the the test properly or not. So you see that? You can able to pick and hold it. And even if it's a smaller size, you can always ask it to pick up different colors, you know? So, well, this is a very good boy. He performed the test very well. So you can always do this test for a boy or uh, children more than nine months or one year when they start to have a pincer grab um, uh, motor development. All right. So now, what if it's a baby or one year old, less than nine months old? You just do simple tests. For example, you just show them a toy. Now look how the child is looking. This is called CSM, central. The eye is center steady, it does not move anywhere, and it maintains, it follows the toys, all right? And you can see he tried to reach for the toys sometimes, all right? Okay, so now look at this baby, an unfortunate baby which is unable to see. This is a bachelor blind baby. So he's not fixing at the toys, and this eye is searching for clue. He's not searching for visual clue, but this baby is searching for an auditory clue. He's listening to the toys. He was looking and trying to locate it. All right, so look at that, all right. Okay, all right. So um, at the end, I'll, I would like to end my <laughs> uh, talk with a thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Azza. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the Q&A session. Please give us a moment while we prepare the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for our guest speaker, please raise your hands and my colleagues will pass you a mic. Before you ask your questions, please do state your name and where you're from and we'd like to encourage you to keep it to one question per person. Can we have the first question? Would anyone like to have a gentleman up front? Uh, I'd like to uh, address this question. My name is Tong. I'd like to address this question to Dr. Lee. Uh, is it necessary for people who have reached a certain age to go for a eye screening for glaucoma test? And what would that 
that age be, and is there a recommendation on that? Thank you. Uh, and how much some mitigation of the cost does it cost? Thank you. <laughs> we we will advise all people, uh, you know, all children <coughs> before six should have an eye examination by by ophthalmologist or by pediatric ophthalmologist better like Dr. Noraza. But because of the constraint, the number of uh, ophthalmologists in Malaysia is not so many, the, so government cannot implement this law. So usually in Malaysia, it depends on the school teacher to do the screening. Standard one, if uh, the school teacher find that patients have a bit, uh, vision not very good, then they will recommend the child to come and see eye doctor. That is a bit too late. When we have a normal examination at this age, the next stage to do a eye examination is around 35 to 40 years old. You should have your second eye examination. That depends on your risk factor. If my patient is glaucoma, bearing in mind their children have 10 times risk, I will say any time from now. Because glaucoma, we do see juvenile glaucoma, Happen as I have a 15 year old child come to me already blind. He read the Snellen chart, the chart you, you read in the eye clinic. Only see second line, pressure was 30 40, the optic nerve already 90% gone. You know, he presented to pediatrician, complain of headache when you have poor vision, headache, giddy, headache, giddy, and CT scan done, normal, nothing done, and not referred to eye specialists. He has a family history of glaucoma, father side, grandfather, father side, grandmother, mother side. So very strong gene. But skip generation, the mother, the father was okay. So was diagnosed very late. So those with family history, as soon as possible. And those normal people with very low risk, I would say 35 to 40 years old, we're not only looking for glaucoma. When we screen your eye, we look from the front to the back. From your cornea, from your iris, your lens, your retina, so many structures we will screen. Yeah? So if you can, we you see your optic nerve is not so healthy, the cup is a bit big, then we will label you as glaucoma suspect, we'll give you a follow up date. So make sure you are properly cared for. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Do we have any other questions from the floor? My name is Wong from Kajang. I want to ask you one question. Let's say a, a confirmed glaucoma patient with a with a pressure main, maintaining around 17, 18 with eye drops, uh, would there be still progression of the damage of the optic nerve over all the years? Okay, management of glaucoma is very individualized. Every eye of one patient at any time depends on the risk factor, the IOP level at that point, the severity of the optic nerve, the social aspect, able to put eye drop or not, side effect of the medications. So for this patient, if your pressure is 17, 18, if you belong to mild glaucoma group, that means your visual field, your cup or optic disc, uh, only about 10, 20% damage, and you do, do uh, look at your visual field, very mild defect, then 17, 18 is okay. Yeah? If your disease is advanced, your nerve already, look at the donut, there's no much fresh in it, the center hole is so big, uh, a rim, a small rim of nerve or no nerve already, when you do a visual field, is totally constricted, then I will aim the pressure of around 12, below 14. 12, 14 is okay. But even though we have to look at the patient as a whole. For example, the patients have diabetic, have hypertension, you know, cannot put medication properly, all that, then you have to consider surgery. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Anyone else, do we have any other questions? Hi, Dr. Lee, I'm Sheila from Klang. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to ask, I'm a glaucoma patient since uh, three years ago, I'm 47. Uh, I think I was diagnosed by you as well, uh, okay, three years back. 
Okay, so can I? Okay, now my pressure is around 12, and I'm seeing uh, Dr. Nurul, uh, the visiting uh, doctor in Clan GH. Yeah. So um, okay, now my my pressure is around 12. Or so lah. I'm I'm now 50. I was diagnosed how many at medi how many medication uh, are you she on? She reduced from three. She reduced to two. Two medications. Ah uh, yes. So we will have to look at your optic nerve mm -hmm. status. Twelve is a good number. Okay. And we want to look at the visual field, mm -hmm. and we want to, we will follow you up, yeah. see how you progress. Every patients have different progression, progression. rate. Yeah, we will monitor your doctor. If you are very stable, you they will do visual field maybe three monthly or six monthly, depends on your conditions. Mm -hmm. And you look, there's a chart we call visual field progression chart, which I showed just yeah. now, my, my uh, 47 years old patient. So from time to time, you can see your visual field mm -hmm. stable or not. Oh, okay. If if deteriorate, we have to think whether you are compliant or not, you put the maximum properly or not, mm -hmm. you come to clinic 12, maybe at home is 19, you know, or other factors. Some mm -hmm. patients on antihypertensive agent, they take the antihypertensive drug at night. At night, the pressure, will, the blood pressure will go very low. The eye pressure also follow. It go too low, then your eye will deprive of oxygen or nutrient supply. That also contribute to progression. Mm -hmm. So, pressure alone is not the magic thing. Mm -hmm. We have to see your eye as a whole, and we need time. You need to see your serial visual field to determine whether you are at the optimum uh, treatment or not. So every time patient, uh, doctor see you, they will set a target pressure. If I see this time not so good, I will bring the target pressure lower. If you have your, your condition is stable at that pressure, then continue. continue. How yeah. about uh, nutrition? Is it very Im important? Can I do something to more to improve, to help me with my food? Okay, nutrition. A lot of people ask this question. Okay, nutrition. Every part of our body need nutrition, right? Mm. If you eat, eat good food, uh, you go to every part of your body. Our eye, certain new, a certain food is bad, good for the eye, like colored vegetable. You know, colored fruit like tomatoes, carrot, all good for eye. You know, lutein are good for eye. But uh, glaucoma is a multifactorial disease. You got your age. You got the genetic factor. A lot of things we cannot uh, really modify. I suppose it help. It, it definitely help. But how much it help? Very difficult to to yeah. produce a clinical trial. You know, our our medicine, Western medicine, is evidence based medicine. It's very difficult to do a trial. Uh, to, to say, to pinpoint which food is good for glaucoma. So far, the only supplement that has undergone a lot of try is Gingo Biloba. You know, Gingo Biloba has been proven improved blood circulation. Those very bad glaucoma or normal tensive glaucoma, we will we'll advise them to take some uh, Gingo Biloba. Uh, not like age-related macular degeneration. There's a big trial in US. They've come up with a formula to improve your macula. Uh, for glaucoma, we don't have this big trial yet. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, there's one more question. Um, okay, my son tends to blink very frequently. <laughs> Is, should I be concerned? He uh, out of habit or what? I'm not sure. Okay, I think this one let Dr. Noraza answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So another question to your son, how many hours you spend on digital devices or screen? <laughs> All right. Because many parents come to me, they say, my child, they blink hard like this. Sometimes they rub their eyes often. That's number one question I ask them. Some even show me a video that they look at the screen like that, you know. So what are they watching, you know? No, this is a normal cartoon thing, but they, they look like that, you know. They, they look at the screen like that. And I told the mother, okay, now, you look carefully how many times they blink. Then they realize. We don't realize that normal people will blink about 20 to 25 times a minute. But when we are doing some cognitive thinking, looking at the screen, concentrating, our blink rate will reduce. Our blink rate reduced up to 10 to 7, uh, seven times a minute. So when we're sitting in the computer, in the screen, in the aircon room, you know, somehow we tend to have some dryness. So that's why my advice that we don't go and tell your kids, no, no more screen, no, 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 no. That's not the current trend now. You must allow them, but you must teach them. I always remember, I remind my patient about 20, 20, 20 rules. 20 minutes of looking at your screen, you must look at the distance 20 feet away, 
and rest for about 20 seconds. That's all you need. And if you still have the symptoms, apply some artificial eye drops. It helps. Thank you. Thank you any very other much. Any other Do we have any other questions from the crowd? Uh, we'll take one question from the back first. Hello, my name is Soon. I've got a question for Dr. Lee. I think in one of your slides, you mentioned something about uh, steroid uh, having an effect on uh, glaucoma. Uh, what if a patient has uh, chronic eczema and he has to apply um, betamethasone and uh, it's a chronic condition? Uh, is there any uh, solution to that? Okay, very good question. Thank you, Mr. Soon. This is a very relevant question. We do see a lot of steroid. We talk about steroid abuse first. Huh? We see a lot of uh, young, not a lot, significant number. Uh, young patients go blind. They go to pharmacy. They got itchy eye or red eye. You know, young people, sometimes they're very concerned about their image. A bit red eye, you know, not nice. Go to pharmacy, put eye drop, eye drop, eye drop. Until they realize they have blurring of vision, they already have advanced glaucoma. I think throughout my career, I have seen at least five young men, 20-something, 30-something, just gone blind. Okay, that is abuse without seeing doctor. The other type is those patients needing steroid like SLE, like chronic eczema. I do have one patient exactly like that referred to me by in, from one of the university. He, he has chronic eczema. You look at him everywhere, the face, the, the upper, the hand, really, really pitiful. He, he was referred to me really, really bad already. Then we, no choice. Scar, a lot of scarring. Usually eczema patients very prone to scarring. Those patients prone to scarring, you can't do a simple surgery, not simple, the trabeclectomy. The, the failure rate is very, very high, so this patient will have to implant a glaucoma drainage device. I managed to save one eye only. I can come to me very advanced already. For this type of patient on steroid, on a, as long as it's under prescription, under care of a doctor, normally your doctor will refer to eye doctor to monitor what are the steroid effects. Not only glaucoma can cause cataract as well. So if I patient like that, I will see them regularly. If the pressure go up, we have to detect early and treat them early. No choice. And we will realize if the doctor control your steroid, is there any other means? Can you cut down the steroid? If you're under control, I think things will be uh, better, better control. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. So I'll come to you in a bit. Hello, uh, this is a question for Dr. Nora, sir. Um, my question is, uh, does lazy eyes happen on adult to adult patient? And uh, another question is, um, eyes patching. Does eyes patching methods can improve lazy eyes uh, for adult? <laughs> And and <laughs> my more question, sorry, sunning. I I don't know whether Dr. Norris have heard sunning, uh, your eyes, in the, uh, sorry under the sun. Close your eyes and just uh, let the sun's lights go into your eyes. Is it to work for any eyes uh, who have a lazy eyes or cataracts? Okay, okay. all right. Thanks. Um, let me go back to the first question. Does lazy eye happens in the uh, adult? Okay. Now, usually lazy eye will not happen in the adult if the adult has a good vision earlier on, during that critical period development. You remember I told you when I, I, show, you a man, I, I give you, show you a slide on um, the visual pathway that usually it uh, happened in the first eight years of life. So if you do have, have any issues in the first eight years of life, it will not occur in the adult. Okay? Um, so most of uh, blurring vision that happens later in life could be other because of eye diseases or something that is correctable for f example refractive errors and all that progressions of refractive errors um, number two whether patching helps to improve um, uh, uh, lazy eye in adult okay well generally we would 
tell our patients that the patching works until eight years old. But there are studies done in the world uh, showing that a positive result, you know. So we never advise our patient to stop patching. Even they grow uh, into uh, teenagers or adulthood, if they had improvements, continue patching because there are studies done. And also studies done showing that they're playing the VR uh, binocular decoptic therapies also not only improve visual acuity, it also helps to improve uh, stereopsis. Stereopsis is 3D, you know, 3D when, when both eyes are seeing and the image will be fused by the brain and you start to see a perceptions of 3D uh, vision. So it improves uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, teenagers or elderly, uh, sorry, elder children, older children as well. Um, about sunning, all right. S now, in, um, um, in myopia progression, yes, there are study done to show that Exposure of early morning sun helps to delay the progressions of myopia. Myopia is um, uh, short-sightedness. You know, some children, they were born with, maybe their parents have high um, myopia, and they were born at maybe, they have, at three years old, maybe they have a three hundreds, uh, minus 300 diopters power. And as they get older, the power progress every year. So if the, the myopia progress, to more than 100 a year. So they need to come for myopia um, uh, treatment. So sun, exposure to early sun is one of the protective factors uh, for uh, delay the progressions of myopia. Right. I'm not sure about any other diseases, but I feel that UV uh, radiation is actually harmful to your macula and also cataract formation. <laughs> Dr. Lee, you have any other things to add? Thank you, Doctor. No doubt, like, uh, like um, most of my friends got uh, their eyes open very big. F uh, for me, like, I feel like uh, my friends said, you have a lazy eyes, like don't focus. You don't focus things. Like I, like I was like, people like open their eyes big and I just like that. Is it called lazy eyes as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean droopy eye. The lids are getting s smaller. Uh, those are droopy eyes, those are not lazy eyes. Lazy eyes, I mentioned, is a disease of the brain rather than the eye itself. It, you may look normal, but you have still can have lazy eyes. So you. maybe you may want to ask, what happens if you don't treat lazy eye? Okay? What if you, have, you live with one eye? So study has shown that children who had lazy eye, who's not gone for treatment when they are earlier uh, stages of many, many reasons, the, the eye will become permanently uh, I would say amblyopia or lazy. So what happened to eyes that did not see? It will tend to drift over time. So you notice that the eye tend to drift out and it wanders and then they look funny. So I have seen a, a case where uh, a young guy who had a uh, power of minus 500 in one eye and normal in the other eye was not corrected earlier. And he, at 27 years old, he has gone for four eye surgery just to straighten the eyes. Because in a sensory um, exotropia, sensory means that the eyes is not seeing well, whatever we do, we try to make the eyes straight, it will still able, we will still able to drift later on. So we only reserve the corrective surgery when they have to go for weddings, you know, when, when they're about to get married or they want to look good on photos and all that, that's the, the time we plan for that study because whatever you do, the eye will still drift later. Mm. We have a question from the gentleman up front. Okay, uh, this question is to Dr. Noraza. Hi, my name is Bernard. Um, my daughter, she, when she was four, she started watching TV slightly slanted. So I brought her to an op optometrist, an uh, eye doctor, for a few years, keep checking her eye. There's no power, not basically like 25, 50. So, but she's still doing it. So uh, I brought her to an autoptist. Autoptist also say no issues. They tested her, everything, uh, basically everything. And uh, she's saying it's a habit. Is that true? Is it really habit or is there something else that can be? Yes, some, some kids that have some certain habit when they try to do things, you know. As long as we have ruled out uh, any other underlying refractive errors or any ocular eye movement abnormality, you are good. You're on good track. So it's just a habit? Yes. Have you tried to correct a habit? For four years? 
still like that. <laughs> yes, that's one thing that you need to do. You actually have to sit with her and motivate her and praise her every time she does a good... Uh, I'm most going to tie her head straight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? So, yeah. My name is Wong. A uh, question for Dr. Lee. Um, is there any um, effects of uh, uh, glaucoma on AMD or AMD on glaucoma? Are they related or one uh, uh, affects the other? The other, the second question is, uh, what is your opinion on these uh, vitamin like vital plux and uh, vital flux? And the like uh, other drops like uh, uh, non-preservative drops. Are there any? I don't know. What's your opinion in general? Yeah, thanks. Okay, both glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration are age-related, so they can co-assist. I mean, patient can have this and that together. Yeah. To answer your second question, Vitalux, Vitalux. The formula formulations of the drug come from a, a trial in the United States. They study a lot of patients and they find that these combinations they can contain some beta carotene, even vitamin A, vitamin C, all those things uh, are good. These combinations are good to prevent age-related macular degenerations. Yeah. Uh, how effective is this? Uh, you have to go look back the study. But having said that, a lot of our food, you know, like if you take a balanced diet, a lot of greens, a lot of colored food, even the, the one uh, Chinese medicine is called keiji, is recognized a lot of uh, uh, lutein inside. So you, if you cook soup, put some lutein, uh, keiji inside, it's good for your eyes. About the tears natural, usually glaucoma patients, they are on multiple eye drops. And eye drops are not without side effects. Uh, the dry eye from the age itself, from the drug, side effect of the drug itself. So most of them have dry eye, especially those already on treatment for a few years. And those who have two or three medications, uh, they have to regularly put the tears natural. Yeah, tears natural come in two form in a multi dose in the bottle that contains a preservative. Those in a small minimum you use in a day and throw that one without preservative. Uh, of course, without preservative is better. Yeah, better more soothing to the eye. Those are very bad, very very bad. Some I do have patients have a lot of side effect from the uh, from the medication. Those candidate you advise them for surgery, because you want quality of life. You can't ask patient. You know you have to keep putting. If not, you go blind. Patient won't put it. In. So that type of case after counseling, then we will go for surgery. And after surgery, the medications can drop to zero or only one, and they'll live very comfortable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctors. Mm. I think that's all the questions that we have. We have one more question. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tan. I just want to find out, for example, um, that I heard that diabetes can lead to blindness, right? And for what period of time will that be? And what is the process that it goes through, you know, leading towards, I think it's retinopathy or something like that. Was blindness? How, how long does it take to the process? And what, what in from year one to year ten, I say, what is the things that happen during that time? And uh, what level of uh, the diabetic level uh, must a person uh, avoid to avoid this kind of uh, problem leading to blindness? Like ten and below is okay, or maybe twelve and above is bad, or something like that. Thank you, Mrs. Tan. Mr. Tan. It is a very good question about diabetes. Okay? Um, now, uh, usually for somebody to have a diabetic retinopathy is over a long uh, certain period of time. Most of the time is more than 10 years of the onset of diabetes. Now, most of us, we do not know when is the onset, right? We feel you are healthy. Suddenly you go for a checkup and you know you have diabetes. So that's the recommendation given is that diabetic retinopathy screening must be then 
at diagnosis for type 2 diabetic retinopathy, which most of the uh, adult uh, patient has. But in type 1 diabetes, when they usually start at younger age, uh, it is advised to check after 10 years or at puberty, whichever that comes first. So it's very important for those who have diabetes to go for a yearly routine checkup, basically to screen, to screen okay, whether they have any diabetic uh, retinopathy or not. Dr. Lee, you might to want to answer about the other side. Okay, you can ask. That. So, for diabetic, you know the complication. Uh, diabetic is a systemic disease, head to toes. Okay, it can have, have complications, kidney failure, you can have a non healing foot ulcer, you can have a myocardial infarction. So, I'm now talking about eye only. I, what you can have is diabetic retinopathy. Yeah? It's a complication from diabetic. You have blood vessels in your eye. You have artery and vein. Simple, huh? understand. Blood vessels in the eye. Eye is the only organ I can see your blood vessel. It's the window of your soul, of course. It's the window of your every part, everything. So I can see your blood vessels. In diabetic patients, if your control is not good, there is ongoing slow damage of your blood vessels and it will become leaky, just like the pipe at home leaking, water leak out. So if the blood, things leak out from your blood vessel, what happens? All your blood cell, red blood cell, all your cholesterol, all leak onto your nerve. Then when we examine the eye, we see patchy, patchy blood and the yellow, yellow thing is your cholesterol on the retina and swelling on your retina. And in that case, your vision will be blurred. More so if happen on your macula. Macula is another important structure on the, at the back of your eye. Optic nerve is one, macula is another part. Just sit side by side. So a lot of deposition of blood, free and cholesterol on your macula blocking and blocking it, then you have blurring of vision. And this condition is very difficult to treat. Once happened, the pipe leaking already, you cannot call a plumber to plug the pipe. No way. Okay? We have maximum intra vitro injection to reduce the swelling, to, to improve the integrity of the blood vessel wall, to resolve, uh, uh, to reduce the swelling. And then we have to do laser also to to uh, reduce the production of new vessels. When this happens, the, the blood vessel leaking, leaking, your, your eye will send a signal saying that I don't have enough oxygen. So how? I will grow new vessel. I form my new vessel. So you have a lot of abnormal vessel in the, at the back of the retina. Then it will bleed easily, cause bleeding. And this bad vessel is very, very bad and it can come to the front, it come to the drainage site, block the drainage site, cause glaucoma. This type of secondary glaucoma is called rubiotic glaucoma. It's very aggressive, usually pressure very high, and the treatment is nothing else, surgery. Put a glaucoma drainage device, at the same time, we have to lie with the diabetic doctor, treating the patients, uh, diabetic for the patient, good control of the diabetic. We have to laser the eye, give injection, and control everything. It's a, a very, I have patient blind from glaucoma. It's irreversible, and it's very difficult to control. So, con Prevention is better than cure, diagnose early, even same for diabetes, treat early. For all diabetic patients, you should have routine eye examination every six months. Every six months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctors. I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Let one more question. Uh, visual feel loss. I'm so uh, so late. Visual feel loss due to glaucoma is irretrievable. What if it's caused by, uh, what do you call it, a stroke? Okay. To what extent can that be retrievable? Thank Very you. good question. Okay, we, glaucoma comes with a, a characteristic pattern visual field loss. It follows the nerve fibers layer pattern. Yeah? Our nerve fiber, just now, if you can remember one of my, my slides, the visual pathway occupies about 65% of your brain. So from your eye, a, at the back of your eye, there's optic nerve. It travels to the back. Your center is here. 
It's called occipital cortex here. So during the, if you have a stroke, it bleed and hit on the pathway, depend on which part it hit. So when we do a visual view on the stroke patient, as you still can see, if you have homonymous hemianopia, for example, he hit on this side, the visual field will present as uh, blind on one side, <laughs> something like that. So by looking at the field, we can diagnose where is the stroke place. It's different pattern. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have one more. Was there another question? For stroke, usually it's not reversible. Stroke, no. Pardon? Intervene straight away, it depends on how fast. I have seen, uh, okay, for example, patient have pituitary tumor. There was a one gentleman, I was called to the <coughs> ER one o'clock in the morning. He just touched down from London. He said d during the flight, he want to go to toilet, he suddenly cannot see. So this time emergency, me as a doctor, I have to go and see. Then just look at him. For, for us, we look at the eye, you know, we know this can happen suddenly or cannot happen. It has, he has been a long-standing tumour in the brain, pituitary tumour. If you have pituitary tumour, the visual field is very characteristic. By temporal hemianopia means this side cannot see and this side cannot see. And his eye already blind one side, one side totally blind and that one is so, so bad already. So uh, the treatment, of course, is uh, removal of the tumor. We send to neurosurgeon. Uh, if you do it very fast, and this gentleman, uh, for me, I think he has quite, at that point, I thought he has quite bad prognosis, but he recovered a little bit. Possible if a tumor is removed very fast. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to share my experience treating one patient. The same condition. He had this very unspecific uh, visual disturbance. Vision is good. Every time you check the vision, you can use everything. But he said, I can't see. So he went to many, many uh, ophthalmologists. And finally, they noticed that there's some visual field problems. So went for MRI. Then they noticed there is a tumor. So she went for a surgery, had it done, and visual field coming back to normal. I think it's quite, as Dr. Lee mentioned, it's reversible if it's detected early. Okay. Um, uh, hello, Dr. Lee. I'm Susila. Okay, this uh, question is about uh, astigmatism. Uh, what causes it and how to prevent it? Okay, can Thank uh, you. Can, can I ask Dr. Noraza to answer? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, astigmatism, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the, the refractive powers that arises because of the different curvature of the cornea. So most of the astigmatism is natural, all right? You were born with it. But there are other conditions where the cornea progressively become more curved as you grow out in condition called cratoconus. Then they can have higher astigmatism and blurring of vision, a progressive blurring of vision. Some astigmatism, uh, like you are born with it, you can't prevent it. Uh, certain certain eye condition, like itchy eyes, yeah, your child have allergic conjunctivitis. You keep rubbing the eye, it can worsen it. <laughs> so to prevent is to don't do, uh, to do, stop rubbing the eyes. Eh? If you got itchy eyes, see doctor get it treated. Certain astigmatism can, is uh, what you can call it iatrogenic. Iatrogenic means secondary to surgery. If your cataract surgeon uh, do not take care of your astigmatism, it can cause more astig after cataract surgery. Or some cataract surgeon they don't put toric lens. Toric lens is one type of lens to correct astigmatism, so your your astig will be worsened or cannot be improved after cataract surgery. And the other uh, condition can worsen your astig is glaucoma surgery. I'm sorry to say that because glaucoma surgery make a shine on your eye and put a glaucoma drainage uh, device on your eye, it can affect the curvature, but no, cho no choice. The astigmatism can be corrected with glasses. I hope you answer your question. Thank you very much, doctors. I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Let's give our doctors a big round of applause and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, take, for all your questions.
And with that, we have come to the end of today's Star Life session. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've registered for the eye check, please do head over to Cyber Hub to get your eyes checked out. And thank you once again for being part of today's session. Please do, uh, don't forget to send us your feedback forms. Our colleagues will be waiting outside. And we hope to see you again in our next Star Life session. Once again, thank you very much, doctors, for your time, uh, for being here today.